In this video, we're going to look at the first part of section 3.4, Proving Conditional Statements Using Direct Proofs. As we've already seen, many definitions and theorems in mathematics have the logical form for all x, p of x implies q of x, or more generally, we have mul multiple variables, for all x1 through for all xn, p of x1 through xn implies q of x1 through xn. To prove a statement of the form for all x, p of x implies q of x is true, we need to show that the conditional propositional function p of x implies q of x is true for all x in its domain. For a given x, the conditional p of x implies q of x is true, except when p of x is true and q of x is false. So to prove that p of x implies q of x is true, we need to show that this situation cannot occur. That is, whenever the hypothesis p of x is true, then the conclusion q of x must also be true. This observation forms the basis of a direct proof of a conditional propositional function, p of x implies q of x. We start by supposing the hypothesis p of x is true. We then show that the conclusion q of x must be true under this assumption. So to prove that a conditional quantified statement of the form for all x, p of x implies q of x is true, we combine a proof by arbitrary element with a direct proof of the conditional propositional function to obtain the following general procedure. Our first step is to specify our variables. Since the statement involves a universal quantifier, we start by supposing x is an arbitrary but fixed element of the domain. Secondly, we suppose our hypothesis p of x is true for this arbitrary element x. Third, we need to show that the conclusion q of x must then be true for this element x using definitions, axioms, previously established results, together with the rules of logic. Before we go over some examples involving direct proofs of conditional statements, we first introduce some definitions about functions whose logical, whose logical form involve conditional statements. For our first definition, a function f from a to b is injective, or one-to-one, -one, provided that for all a1 and a2 in a, if a1 is not equal to a2, then f of a1 is not equal to f of a2. This means that distinct elements a1 and a2 in the domain a of our function are mapped into distinct elements in the codomain B of the function. In symbolic form, f is injective, provided that for all a1 and a2 and a, a1 not equal to a2 implies f of a1 is not equal to f of a2. Note that the condition in the definition is equivalent to the contrapositive statement. For all a1 and a2 and a, f of a1 equals f of a2 implies a1 is equal to a2. You'll find that text will occasionally use the contrapositive statement as the definition itself. To prove the original statement, we start by supposing the hypothesis a1 is not equal to a2. We then need to show the conclusion f of a1 is not equal to f of a2. To prove the contrapositive statement, we would start by supposing the hypothesis f of a1 equals f of a2. We then need to show the conclusion a1 is, not equal, a1 is equal to a2. In general, you'll find that it's easier to prove an equality such as a1 equals a2 than an inequality such as f of a1 not equal to f of a2. For this reason, the contrapositive statement is often easier to prove than the original statement. A function f from a to b is not injective, provided that the negation of the condition in the definition holds. That is, provided that there exists an a1 and a2 and a, such that a1 is not equal to a2, but f of a1 is equal to f of a2. Another way of saying this is there exist distinct elements a1 and a2 in the domain of f that are mapped to the same element f of a1 equals f of a2 in the codomain. We can illustrate the definition in the following diagrams. So the first diagram below illustrates the conditional propositional function in the definition. We see distinct elements a1 and a2 in the function domain are mapped to distinct elements f of a1 and f of a2 in the function codomain. The function is injective, provided that this holds for all elements a1 and a2 in the function domain. A function f is not injective, provided that there exists distinct elements a1 and a2 in the domain of f that are mapped to the same element f of a1 equals f of a2 in the codomain, as illustrated in this diagram. For our first example, let's let f be the function from r to r defined by f of x equals x cubed plus 1 for each x in r. We want to show that f is injective. 
As mentioned above, the contrapositive statement is usually easier to prove than the original statement, so we'll prove the contrapositive statement in this example. In symbolic form, to show f is injective, we need to show for all x1 and r, for all x2 and r, f of x1 equals f of x2 implies x1 is equal to x2. Here, the domain of our function is the set of real numbers r, so we're going to have elements in the domain r, and so it's a little more appropriate to use x1 and x2 for those elements rather than a1 and a2 as appear in the definition. Once we have the symbolic form, we're ready to start the proof. So we'll start by supposing x1 and x2 are arbitrary real numbers. We suppose the hypothesis, f of x1 equals f of x2. We then need to show the conclusion, x1 is equal to x2. Now it's very important to understand when you're proving a conditional statement that you have to start with the hypothesis and you have to derive the conclusion from it. It's a very common error to go backwards and to start with the conclusion and to derive the hypothesis. Now according to the definition of the function, f of x1 equals x1 cubed plus 1 and f of x2 equals x2 cubed plus 1. So the hypothesis, f of x1 equals f of x2, can be rewritten as x1 cubed plus 1 equals x2 cubed plus 1. Subtracting 1 from both sides of this equation, we obtain x1 cubed equals x2 cubed. Now taking cube roots, we obtain the cube root of x1 cubed equals the cube root of x2 cubed. And we know that the cube root of x1 cubed is just x1, and the cube root of x2 cubed is just x2, so this implies x1 equals x2, which is our conclusion. So this proves the conditional propositional function for arbitrary elements x1 and x2, and thus f is injective. There are a few things to be careful of in constructing a proof of a conditional statement as in this example. Again, as mentioned earlier, First, we must work from the hypothesis f of x1 equals f of x2 to the conclusion x1 equals x2 and not the other way around. Second, as we work from the hypothesis to the conclusion, we should justify each step. I want to talk briefly about disproving conditional statements. Suppose we wish to disprove a conditional statement of the form for all x, p of x implies q of x. To disprove a universally quantified statement, we need to find a counterexample, an element x in the domain for which the propositional function is false, or equivalently, an element x in the domain for which the negation of the statement is true. Now the negation of the statement is going to be there exists an element x such that p of x and not q of x. So we must show that there exists an element x in the domain for which p of x is true but q of x is false. As an example, let's let f be the function from r to r defined by the formula f of x equals x squared plus 1 for each x and r. We want to show that f is not injective. Secondly, we can ask how can this function be modified so as to obtain a function which is injective? Now before we show that f is not injective, suppose we tried to show that it is injective. What goes wrong? To show that f is injective, we would need to show for all x1 and r, for all x2 and r, f of x1 equals f of x2 implies x1 equals x2. We start our proof by supposing x1 and x2 are arbitrary real numbers. We suppose the hypothesis f of x1 equals f of x2. We then need to show the conclusion x1 equals x2. This is just as we started the previous example. According to the definition of the function, f of x1 equals x1 squared plus 1, and f of x2 equals x2 squared plus 1, so the hypothesis f of x1 equals f of x2 can be rewritten as x1 squared plus 1 equals x2 squared plus 1. If we proceed as before, we would start by subtracting 1 from both sides of this equation to obtain x1 squared equals x2 squared. In the last example, we had x1 cubed equals x2 cubed, and we took the cube root of both sides at this point in the proof. Here, we have x1 squared equals x2 squared, so in a similar manner, we can start by taking the square root of both sides, and we'll have the square root of x1 squared equals the square root of x2 squared. Now, here is where the proof fails. We need to show for our conclusion that x1 is equal to x2. However, x, the square root of x1 squared does not necessarily equal x1, and the square root of x2 squared does not necessarily equal x2. 
For instance, when x1 is equal to negative 2, then the square root of x1 squared would be the square root of negative 2 squared, which is just the square root of 4, which is going to be 2, not negative 2. In general, it can be shown that for any real number x, the square root of x squared is equal to the absolute value of x. For instance, the square root of 2 squared is equal to the square root of 4, which is 2, which is also equal to the absolute value of 2. The square root of negative 2 squared is equal to the square root of 4, which is also 2, which is equal to the absolute value of negative 2. So after taking square roots in the above equation, we obtain the absolute value of x1 is equal to the absolute value of x2. The problem arises because we are not able to conclude from this equality the required conclusion that x1 is equal to x2, which means our proof fails. Now let's get back to what we wanted to show in the first place, namely that f is not injective. First note that just because our proof that f is injective fails, we cannot conclude that f is not injective. In general, if you try to prove something and you fail at proving it, it does not mean that the result is false. To show that f is not injective, we need to show the negation of the statement in the definition, which is there exists x1 and x2 and r such that x1 is not equal to x2 and f of x1 is equal to f of x2. So we need to show that there exist real numbers x1 and x2 such that x1 is not equal to x2, but f of x1 equals f of x2. Since we are proving an existential statement, we could set this up using the two-column format. Alternatively, just using our knowledge about the function, we can just choose for a counterexample two values for x1 and x2. For instance, x1 is equal to negative 3 and x2 is equal to positive 3. Then we know that x1 and x2 are both real numbers and x1 is clearly not equal to x2, but f of x1 is equal to negative 3 squared plus 1, which is 10, and f of x2 is positive 3 squared plus 1, which is also 10, so that f of x1 is equal to f of x2. So this proves our existential statement, so we can conclude that our function f is not injective. Now the second part of the problem asks, how could we modify our function so that we would obtain a function which is injective? Now one of the reasons this particular function f is not injective is that its domain includes both positive and negative numbers. To obtain an injective function, we could change the domain of f to exclude the negative numbers. For instance, suppose we change the domain to the set of non-negative numbers, the interval from 0 to infinity. Then the resulting function f from this new domain into r will be injective. To prove this, we would again go back to the condition in the definition for all x1 and x2 in the interval from 0 to infinity, f of x1 equals f of x2 implies x1 is equal to x2. We suppose x1 and x2 are arbitrary, non-negative real numbers. We suppose the hypothesis f of x1 equals f of x2. We then need to show the conclusion x1 equals x2. As before, we would obtain f of x1 is x1 squared plus 1 and f of x2 is x2 squared plus 1. So our hypothesis becomes x1 squared plus 1 equals x2 squared plus 1. Subtracting 1 from both sides of this equation, we obtain x1 squared equals x2 squared. Taking the square root of both sides, we now obtain the square root of x1 squared equals the square root of x2 squared, which, as we said before, gives us the absolute value of x1 equals the absolute value of x2. But now we know that our x values, x1 and x2, are both non-negative. They're both greater than or equal to 0 which implies that the absolute value of x1 is equal to x1 and the absolute value of x2 is equal to x2. So this implies x1 equals x2, which is our required conclusion. This proves our conditional propositional function for arbitrary elements x1 and x2 in our domain, and thus our function f is injective. Instead of showing that a specific function is injective, as in the previous examples, our next example proves the result that holds for injective functions in general. So we want to prove that the composition of any two injective functions is injective. That is, we want to prove for all functions f from a to b and g from b to c, if f and g are injective, then their composition, g composed with f, from a to c is injective. Our first step is to write this in symbolic form. So in symbolic form, we need to prove for all f, for all g, f is injective and g is injective implies g composed with f is injective.
This is a universal statement with a conditional propositional function, so we'll start with a proof by arbitrary element. So we'll suppose that f from a to b and g from b to c are arbitrary functions. We suppose the hypothesis that f is injective and g is injective. We then need to show the conclusion that the composition g composed with f is injective. Now at this point in the proof, you want to ask yourself, well, what does this conclusion mean? Or how do we show this conclusion? And so we go back to the definition of injective. So to show that G composed with F is injective, we need to show for all A1 and A, for all A2 and A, G composed with F of A1 equals G composed with F of A2 implies A1 is equal to A2. This is just the condition for a function to be injective applied to the function G composed with F. This is now a universal statement with another conditional propositional function. So to prove this, we'll use a proof by arbitrary element so we'll start by supposing a1 and a2 are arbitrary elements of a. We suppose the hypothesis that g composed with f of a1 equals g composed with f of a2. We then need to show the conclusion that a1 is equal to a2. According to the definition of the composition, g composed with f of a1 is g of f of a1, and g composed with f of a2 is g of f of a2. So g composed with f of a1 equals g composed with f of a2 implies g of f of a1 equals g of f of a2. Now if we let f of a1 equal b1 and f of a2 equal b2, this last equation can be rewritten as g of b1 equals g of b2. Since g is injective, then this implies that b1 is equal to b2 or f of a1 equals f of a2. Now since f is injective, this last equation implies that a1 is equal to a2, as required. So this proves that g composed with f is injective. This proof illustrates a few important ideas. Okay, now the first is, in general, when constructing a proof, it's more helpful to focus first on the conclusion instead of the hypotheses. In this proof, the original conclusion is that G composed with F is injective. At this point in the proof, we then applied the definition to determine what needed to be shown in order to prove this conclusion. That resulted in another universal statement with a conditional propositional function. To prove this statement, we used a direct proof, resulting in a new conclusion, A1 is equal to A2. Only at this point did we go back and try to apply the hypotheses. We then use the hypothesis that G is injective to conclude that B1 is equal to B2. According to the definition, G is injective means for all B1 and B, for all B2 and B, G of B1 equals G of B2 implies B1 is equal to B2. So what this means is, for any elements B1 and B2 and B, G of B1 equals G of B2 implies B1 is equal to B2. In the proof, we had supposed for particular elements B1 and B2 and B, the hypothesis g of b1 equals g of b2 of this statement. So using the definition of g being injective, it allows us to conclude that b1 is equal to b2. Similarly, f is injective means for all a1 and a2 and a, f of a1 equals f of a2 implies a1 equals a2. In the proof, we had reached the point where we obtained the hypothesis f of a1 equals f of a2 of this statement which then allowed us to conclude that a1 is equal to a2. Now instead of writing the symbolic form of each of these hypotheses in the proof itself, it's often more helpful to just refer to the hypotheses to draw the conclusion. Next we want to look at some other definitions involving functions that include conditionals. So we'll start with a function f from r to r and let i be an in interval. Our first definition, for our first definition, the function f is monotone increasing on the interval i, provided that for all x1 and x2 and i, if x1 is less than x2, then f of x1 is less than or equal to f of x2. The function f is strictly increasing on i, provided that for all x1 and x2 and i, if x1 is less than x2, then f of x1 is strictly less than f of x2. So we've changed our inequality from a less than or equal to to a strict less than. Now if we flip our inequality around, we obtain that the function f is monotone decreasing on i, provided that for all x1 and x2 and i, if x1 is less than x2, then f of x1 is greater than or equal to f of x2. 
And if we change this to a strict inequality, we obtain the function f is strictly decreasing on i, provided that for all x1 and x2 and i, if x1 is less than x2, then f of x1 is strictly greater than f of x2. Now the function in the diagram on the left is a strictly increasing function, while the function in the diagram on the right is a strictly decreasing function. Now the graph of a strictly increasing function rises from left to right, while the graph of a strictly decreasing function falls from left to right. So these are properties of functions that you're likely familiar with from calculus. Now for the function on the left, x1 and x2 represent arbitrary elements of the domain for which x1 is less than x2. And we can see in the diagram that f of x1 is going to be less than f of x2, as required in the definition for a strictly increasing function. For the function on the right, we again have x1 is less than x2, but now f of x1 is greater than f of x2, as appears in the definition for a strictly decreasing function. In the next example, we want to apply the definition to show that a specific function is strictly increasing on an interval. In calculus, you learn a lot of different techniques for showing that a function is increasing or decreasing using the derivative. Here, we just want to, strict, we just want to use the definition alone. So for our example, let's let f be the function from r to r defined by f of x equals x squared plus 1 for all x and r. We want to show that f is strictly increasing on the interval from 0 to infinity. In symbolic form, we need to show for all x1 and x2 in the interval from 0 to infinity, x1 is less than x2 implies f of x1 is less than f of x2. This is another universal statement, so we'll start with a proof by arbitrary element. We suppose x1 and x2 are arbitrary positive real numbers. We suppose the hypothesis x1 is less than x2. We then need to show the conclusion f of x1 is less than f of x2. Using the formula for the function, we can see that the conclusion is equivalent to x1 squared plus 1 is less than x2 squared plus 1. To prove the conclusion, we're going to start by multiplying both sides of the hypothesis x1 less than x2 by x1. Since x1 is positive, this will preserve the inequality, so we get x1 squared is less than x1 x2. Now multiply both sides of our hypothesis x1 less than x2 by x2. Since x2 is also positive, we'll get x1 x2 is less than x2 squared. Then these two inequalities, x1 squared less than x1 x2 and x1 x2 less than x2 squared, imply x1 squared is less than x2 squared. Now add 1 to both sides to obtain x1 squared less than x2 squared plus x1 squared plus 1 is less than x2 squared plus 1. This proves our conclusion and so thus our function f is strictly increasing. Now this last example relied upon recalling some properties of inequalities. If we're used to applying various operations to equalities involving numbers and having the equalities preserved. For instance, we can add the same quantity to both sides of an equality and the equality will be preserved, or we can square both sides of an equality and the equality will be preserved. While many of these operations can be applied to inequalities and the inequality will be preserved, others cannot. So when both numbers are positive, squaring both sides of an inequality will preserve the inequality. For instance, squaring both sides of 2 is less than 5 gives us 4 is less than 25, which is still true. When both numbers are negative, after squaring both sides of an inequality, we need to reverse the inequality. For instance, when squaring both sides of negative 4 is less than negative 2, we need to reverse the inequality to obtain negative 4 squared is greater than negative 2 squared, or 16 is greater than 4. When one number is negative and the other is positive, we can't really draw any general conclusions. We'll need to know the specific values of the numbers. The point of this observation is that when you're dealing with inequalities, you need to be very careful about what operations you apply to the inequalities. The following order axioms of the real numbers outline the basic properties of inequalities of real numbers. The first is called the trichotomy law, and what it says is for all x, y, and r exactly one of the three relations x is less than y, or x is equal to y, or x is greater than y holds. So given two real numbers, one of the numbers is less than the other, 
or the two numbers are equal. Our second property is a preservation under addition property. For all x, y, z, and r, if x is less than y, then we can add z to both sides to obtain x plus z is less than y plus z, and the inequality is preserved. For our third property, we're looking at preservation under multiplication. And this has two parts. For all x, y, z, and r, if x is less than y and z is greater than zero, then we can multiply both sides of the inequality to obtain x, z is less than y, z, and the, inequal the inequality is preserved. For the second part, for all x, y, z, and r, if x is less than y and z is less than zero, so z is negative, then multiplying both sides of the inequality by z requires us to flip the inequality. So we'll obtain x, z is greater than y, z. And finally, our fourth law is the transitive law. For all x, y, z, and r, if x is less than y and y is less than z, then x is less than z. So these four axioms can be used to derive all the properties of inequalities of real numbers. So when you're working with inequalities, you're allowed to use these four order axioms along with whatever results that we prove using these four order axioms.